show you seven to eight minutes of a film I made a few years, a couple of years ago, called A Measure of Impunity, on which will give us some idea of, of existing conditions or exist more contemporary conditions in some parts of the Northeast. Northeast of India, bordering Myanmar, Bangladesh, and China. A pastoral way of life is characterized on the surface by tranquility. The sounds and scenes of the changing seasons, of hard working farming communities, as they seem to have always been. But all is not as it seems. These sturdy life stories have been torn asunder by brutality, much of it undocumented and unheard in the stillness of time. For more than 60 years, parts of the Northeast have been among the world's most militarized zones, with conflicts between the state and armed groups challenging the idea of India, among guerrilla groups, between ethnic communities, ordinary people are caught in the crossfire. As the region emerges from decades of violence, many stories, silenced for long, are now unraveling. The most vulnerable in these conflicts will be women and children. This film is about the stories of suffering that have not been told before in the states of Nagaland and Assam. Our story begins in Nagaland. In the 90s, the children were watching the TV and then the army came and surrounded the TV hall, I mean a video hall, and all of here, the children started running away. 
because at the time there was a fierce hypothesis about the army, because the armies were ruthlessly operating. So out of fear, after all, there are children. They dispersed, they ran away from there. And when they ran off from the video hall, then the, the, there was no escape route for them, for one of the children, about uh, 12 to 13 years old, studying in class 6. So he went inside the bus, which is kept there at night, which is the bus station. It was in the bus station in the middle of the town. And then the army shot the boy. Anna in neighboring Assam, pain clashes with beauty in Kokrajhar district. This young Bodo woman is a widow, a victim of conflicts among armed factions. She says members of a rival group shot her husband. After that incident, she desperately wants to keep her only child safe and has done what appears unthinkable under normal circumstances, placed him with other child orphans of conflict in this orphanage. Their traditions would be protected, their 
this agreement was for a period of 10 years. After 10 years, the Nagas would have the right to choose what they would do, whether to renew the agreement to stay with India or to go on their own. But within, before the independence, this was in July, within a month or two that was rejected by the state government of Assam because the Naga Hills were a part of Assam at that time. And of course the center rejected it. And uh, it led to a lot of resentment among the uh, Naga leadership, uh, and which coincided at that point with the rise of somebody called Angami Zaku Fizo. And Mr. Fizo became the head of the National Council. He um, tried to have discussions with the government of Assam and the government of India. It didn't work. Um, there was an effort by uh, a group of Naga elders to meet Pandit Nehru in uh, Kohima when he came for a, a public uh, lecture, to give a public talk with uh, Mr. Unu, the then Premier of uh, Burma. Uh, the Deputy Commissioner refused to give them permission to call on the Prime Minister. So there was a bit of a disagreement. And as Nehru came to give his lecture, all that he saw were the backsides of people who left slapping their bottoms in anger and contempt. So after that, that was his first and I think his last visit to Nagar. He never went after that. I'm talking about this because what, how do personal experiences shape policy and perceptions? In 19, by 1955, the uh, Nagar National Council decided after having uh, organized what it called a referendum uh, that most of the people of the Nagar Hills wanted independence from India and they declared separation. The government of India reacted, uh, I think uh, understandably, like a country that had been through the horror of partition and was faced with the first challenge to the concept, the idea of India, within a few years of that experience. And um, it started with the police action, and then when the police action was inadequate, um, they moved uh, to the army. But for that, you needed to develop a law that would enable the army and the security forces to operate. So he has the Disturbed, Air, Disturbed Areas Act by which the central government or the state government would declare an area disturbed, which would enable another law, the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, to be uh, implemented and used against uh, potential targets. I'm sure all of you have read the AFSPA. It's a very bare six clause act. And uh, the critical clauses are, are uh, the Article 4 and the uh, last one, Article 6, or Clause 4, Clause 6. Clause 4 gives um, powers to the, uh, of the uh, officer and the people under his command to shoot on suspicion uh, to the point of causing death. Uh, on people who they suspect of um, activities against the state. And the last clause, as you would know, says that no one who is uh, conducting operations under this act is liable to criminal prosecution until, <clears throat> until the central government gives permission. Between 1958 and 2014, that's 56 years, not a single prosecution has been cleared. Not that 
must be not. So that's the law. What happens? Uh, what happened in that time? Because uh, it is something that some of my friends have experienced, and I'll talk only of, of two states and briefly about them before moving to the next part of the conversation. The first is um, Nagaland. Um, I don't think that there is there anyone from Nagaland here? Um, I don't think that there is a single family in Nagaland that has not suffered from the impact of conflict, either at the hands of the security forces or at the hands of the underground, the various factions of the underground, in one way or the other. I remember um, going to Kohima for a, a brief discussion, small discussion with about 10 people. It was some years ago. And uh, there were several officers from the government who were there, including uh, a very senior uh, commissioner from the Social Welfare Department, who was very silent right through the discussions. Um, until one of the uh, women officers uh, spoke about how even today, when somebody bangs the door, she ducks under the table, thinking it's a gunshot. You know, the immediate, and she's she was then in her forties, so now I guess she's about forty. And this is about thirty years after the event. Um, that the experience of people, in many cases shaped by what happened in childhood. Uh, her, in her case, there was firing uh, from the security forces at uh, various underground groups. Her parents got her and the children to lie flat on the ground. It's like a war zone at that time. So the bullets came through the windows. So they were lying under the table in, in places which would be regarded as safe. At the end of that, this uh, older, more senior person said, he said, I haven't said this to anybody before. But I am a senior officer of the government. But my brother was in the underground and he was shot. So right now, right in that room, you had you know, the complexities and the pain of that situation. Families divided people divided and living in some area of degree of fear even there. On the same trip I went, I was in Dimapur, from the conversation, in the office, there was a pastor from a church. And he says, he says, even today, when I hear the sound of a jeep, if I'm sleeping, I wake up sweating. Because the sound of a jeep at night to him represented the army of the security forces coming to raid the village or to search the village. And the children would be sent out through the back door into the forest. And they would be brought back by their parents when they, they regarded it as safe. So this is, this is what has shaped, marked, the psyche of people and shape their responses to policies which I would say are policies of exclusion. You take uh, Mizoram. If you go to Mizoram even today, it was then the Lushai Hills of Assam. On the, I think it was the 4th and 5th of March, 4th uh, and 5th of, yeah, March. They wear black arm bags. Do you know why they do that? Anybody? The only place in the country's history which has been bombed by the Indian Air Force to deal with an insurgency. Because ISOL and 
had almost been taken over by the Mizo National Front. The only place holding out was a little block of a hill, uh, just about what's called Treasury Square, and uh, that was the Assam Rifles uh, garrison. And uh, they were in danger of falling if these guys had kept up the pressure for another day. So then they got reinforcements. But in the meantime, the jets came, Hunter and Tufan jets, and attacked uh, Aizol and two other uh, little more than villages, uh, towns, um, in, in, in the Dushai Hills. Not many people were killed, but the devastation, as you can imagine, uh, of incendiary bombs and strafing was very, very extensive. Nobody in government has ever talked about it, certainly in the central government. This is all, this is all coming out only in, in recent years. Um, I'm working on a, on a project on this, on a study on this, and how the Mizos have coped with it. The Mizos have coped with it by not talking about it. It's only now that conversations, books, articles, experiences are being shared after 50 years of what people went through. So it's very important for us to know hidden histories, hidden experiences. And as part of that, I would like to share with you that at that time, the population of the Lushai Hills district, the current Mizoram, was 280,000. The government of India decided on a policy called regrouping. It meant that 220,000 people were moved from their homes, their villages where they lived all their lives. The villages and homes were set on fire in front of them. They were given half an hour to one hour to pack up their goods, put them on the back of a truck or on a uh, bus, and at gunpoint, they were forced to leave and taken to a place which they did not, did not know, where they mingled with people who they had never met before. Their old connections to their homes, to their traditions, to their lives was completely sundered. And this was part of the pacification. So if you go to Mizoram, most villages are post-1966. Only a few have gone back to the old village. And the idea was to deny the insurgents access, easy access to shelter and uh, food, because the new uh, settlements were along the road, which could be controlled by the army and the security. So we must, I think it is very important to, to understand the history of, there's a history of resentment and opposition. Why does it come? What would you do if you were in a situation like that? How would you react? How would your parents react? What is also interesting to me today is that the situation of resistance of the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s has been, if not replaced, we are seeing a situation of acceptance of the larger idea of India. Um, even in this room, if you look across um, any part of any metro, large numbers of young people are migrating from the Northeast, from Mizoram, from Nagaland, from Assam, they go not just to the metros, but to smaller towns and cities across India in search of work and uh, education. So there is an acceptance, if not an embracing, of the idea of India, because it has taken 50 years to come to a position where you say that, OK, we need to move from here, and this is possibly the way to do so. Um, but a converse, um, a converse, shall we say, um, migration, in migration to the northeast is not really taking place. <coughs> I'd like to 
move from that to um, because I, as I said, the policies of exclusion have included laws which have really uh, enforced a situation of distance, yeah, created distance and concretized it. The British, in their infinite wisdom, decided to develop a policy of permits for people to go into hill areas. So even today, uh, if I want to go, if any of you want to go to Nagaland, to Mizoram, to Arunachal Pradesh, you will need a chit, small paper, which you collect from the local liaison office or from the, uh, what do you call it, the uh, resident commissioner's office. It will uh, cost you 25 rupees. You have to give a photograph, your father's name, your name, why you are going to Arunachal or whatever. It's called an inner line permit. With that permit, you can go in. And Mizoram, they have liberalized, you can get it at the airport. It's like visa on arrival. Okay. It's a nice one. Um, but um, that's the inner line permit. And there's also a restricted areas or protected areas for me, which is for foreigners. So it's a multi-layered this whole thing. So um, they're not as strict as they used to be, uh, but sometimes they can get the police can get a bit difficult. So that was another part of the policy which was continued by the the government of India that you have a policy of constraint on who can enter these areas because that was aimed at enabling uh, local communities, small communities to protect themselves, to not be overwhelmed by outsiders coming in, especially from the plains. And that was part of uh, a schedule uh, in the constitution which was developed uh, by the constitution uh, makers. Uh, called the sixth schedule. We have the fifth schedule and the sixth schedule. The fifth schedule is for other parts of India, like central India and so on. The sixth schedule is for parts of the northeast. So, um, so you have a situation where a lot of people are going out, but not many people are coming in. But when you talk to people from the region, uh, often you hear that there's a problem of Bangladeshis. The Bangladeshis are coming, they're taking our land. Um, there was an agitation against them in the 80s by the All Assam Students Union, which became very famous and very um, popular. Uh, it spread to the other states, to Manipur, to, uh, to Meghalaya, certainly. And, um, the target uh, were Bangladeshis uh, in quotes. These were seen as people who had come in from East Pakistan and Bangladesh and who constituted a threat to the demography of Assam certainly and uh, to a lesser degree of the other states. Now, as somebody who's Research the, the issue both in, in Assam and, and in Bangladesh. I would say this that there has been migration, expensive migration in the past, but it has diminished. It is much less than what it was because conditions in Bangladesh have improved. That's the interesting thing. It has a better uh, maternal mortality rate, better infant mortality rate, a better access to education in terms of uh, girl child, uh, better nutrition levels than many parts of India and certainly several parts of the world. <coughs> Assam by itself has the worst maternal mortality ratio in the country. I've often argued that it is more dangerous for a young woman to be giving birth in rural Assam than any threat from any insurgent or anything else. A high chance of mortality. 
It used to be as bad as almost 500 a few years ago. Now it's improved, it's 372. Bihar and Jharkhand is 302. Goa and uh, uh, Goa is at uh, Europe levels. Um, so uh, why has this happened? How is it that an area that speaks um, and is spoken of as having a great deal of uh, respect and dignity for women actually has conditions which are inimic to their health and well-being. One is, of course, the total failure of government after government to reach out to the poorest and the most vulnerable. And uh, to me, uh, that includes people who live in Western Assam, Boros, Muslims, and, and other groups, as well as on the islands of the Brahmaputra. The islands of the Brahmaputra are a classic case of settlement. Uh, there are 2,500 odd islands on the river, not just from Madhuri, and 30 lakh people, that's one tenth of the population of the state lives there. Not many people know this, and I didn't know what it until I started researching. Um, but if you go back to the issue of Bangladesh, sometimes you hear people in Assam say that the next chief, one future chief minister of Assam will be from Bangladesh. Yeah? There is fear and resentment both combined, which is a very deadly concoction. If you look at the facts, after Kashmir, Assam has the largest um, population of Muslims to, to in ratio to population. Uh, in Kashmir, it's a majority. In Assam, it's 35 percent, 35, 36 percent. Obviously, if you believe one particular rhetoric of the right wing, everybody is a Bangladesh. That's not so. There are, shall we say, three degrees of migration into Assam, of, of migrants into Assam. One is those who came and settled down centuries ago. Islam came to Assam on the banks of the Brown Water in the 12th century, brought by a prince from Iran. Settled. They became Assamese. So even Talish says these people have no connection to Islam. They, they married locally. They are they are Muslim only in name. They have no connection to their faith. So he was very disapproved. But the second migration came over the 19th century when the British settled people on wastelands, and large tracts were opened up for settlement and immigration from East Bengal. The third move came, uh, large migration came during the 71 uh, war, which led uh, to the creation of Bangladesh. Uh, into India came approximately 10 million refugees. What not many people like to talk about is that 80% of the population of refugees were Hindus. 75 to 80%. They are not all Muslim. You know, so there is this thing that we keep thinking about, that they are all Muslims who came. There large numbers, very large numbers, within, from Bangladesh. One million stayed back, nine million went back. And uh, the state, one million stayed on in India, um, the others went back. And then post-71, you have the steady immigration of people from Bangladesh. And Bangladeshi scholars themselves have said that the migration of out from Bangladesh has taken place during times of acute famine, uh, natural and natural calamities. Like 74, 75, there was a major famine in Bangladesh in which lakhs of people died. Major flood surges which forced people to leave migrate. 
that a lot of migration takes place within Bangladesh itself. So, when we uh, hear about conflicts like two years ago, the, the tragedy in the Bodo areas took place, and people are saying, oh, the Bangladeshis are responsible. And I was on a TV interview, I think an Indian TV, and the anchor suddenly asked me, what about Bangladesh? I said, what about Bangladesh? Where did they come? There's nothing to do with Bangladesh. It's all about land. So whether it is the Naga Hills, the Mizo Hills, Assam, the struggle for identity elsewhere in the region, it, the core issue is land connected to mobilization of your ethnic identity. In the border areas, this is again a very critical issue. Because areas which were uh, where their lands were protected under various regulations have been encroached upon, forests that disappeared, that turned into pastoral lands, grazing lands, cultivated lands. And so they have long felt a sense of alienation and bitterness at this. But in the process, and I'm going to cut a long story short, um, into the 80s and into the 90s, um, by the by 1991-92, uh, various insurgent armed groups started taking uh, shape in the Bodo areas. They were connected with Ulfa and the others, and you had a situation where the first attacks on non borough communities actually took place in 1993. Previous to that, you will not find any history of communal clashes. So the last 20 years have seen communal clashes in Western Assam between the Boros and other groups, between the Boros and Muslims, Boros Sankals and Adivasis, which is the group of communities living in that wage wage of land. Now the issue of Bangladeshi just comes up from time to time. Whenever I think people want to blame somebody, a hidden hand, somebody who's easy to blame, uh, you know the Bangladeshi becomes the favorite whipping boy. But often it these people who are targeted and have been targeted over the past uh, decades are people who have been there for generations. So there will be some in-migration, yes. There will be Bangladeshis there, yes, as there are in Delhi, something like five to six lakh Bangladeshis live in Delhi, perhaps more. Um, but they are not the tipping point for this issue. And they should be made scapegoats. Um, you will find that if you just look at facts, <coughs> the place which saw on the worst violence in 2012 and where issues of migration in Bangladeshization was talked to, talk about was Kolkata. I believe that it has uh, one of the lowest growth rates, population growth rates in the country. So that enables us to ask the question, where are these people? And I would uh, advise anybody who talks about illegal migration to talk about it with abundant caution, especially because there are, um, I'm talking about communities who have been there for, for a long time. And we must discriminate between those who came post-71 and those who were there before 71. Before 71 are Indian nationals. And uh, what has increasingly happened is that many people are getting targeted who are nationals of this country. And that is not something that I think any of us can, can, can accept. Um, in, the, um, in the incidents in 2012, um, 
there was an element of involvement of uh, the Borough Territorial Council uh, government. At least one member of the council was arrested for leading a riot with, on armed with automatic weapons with his people. And um, in, in this case, in the latest case, there has been uh, accusations of the uh, another existing faction, the Sundaji faction, faction of the NDFP, the National Democratic Front of Berlin, of being responsible. I think that may be partly true. But I think it's also true that um, there were statements by uh, political leaders which said that um, the Boro candidate, or one of the Boro, the main principal Boro candidate was unlikely to win the election this time. And that is because if for 20 years the majority have been at the receiving end of violence and uh, intimidation and harm, if one side is having, which has uh, a minor, which is actually a minority, has control of politics, power, economic assets, uh, distribution of uh, funds, as well as weapons, and the other side does not have much. I think after 20 years, it's understandable why people perhaps have voted the way they have. I mean, I'd be very interesting to, interested to see on the 16th who was actually won in the Boro area. And I'm, I think that it's uh, probably unlikely to be the, the main uh, Boro candidate, which they themselves uh, are saying, the, of cross voting and uh, the <coughs> non borough groups uh, coming together. So the, the whole point of, of, of resentments and, and, and reactions. You know, people mobilize themselves if the government can't help them peacefully. Then they mobilize themselves and, and try and deal with it as best as they can. And I think that one of the uh, ways One of the things that they are saying, which is something that all of us should also look at, is people are fed up of short gun marriages. People are fed up of quick accords which are done without involving a majority of people, without in involving communities who uh, face the brunt of the music or who are impacted by the, by the accords. And I think that that is something, that's a message that's coming across loud and clear. And people are, are speaking out on these, on these issues. Um, how do you resolve issues like this? Is there a way of resolving them in such a complicated, complex region? Added to add to the complexity the fact that there are hundreds of automatic weapons floating around. Many of those who surrendered did not surrender the weapons, they hidden them somewhere under somebody's, uh, in somebody's paddy field, under somebody's uh, house, and they come out when the need is, is, uh, is required. So I I think one way is that apart from building building a, a process of peace, you have to involve communities at the village and the local level. You cannot impose solutions which are basically an example or examples of manufacturing <coughs> concept. With the government on one side, the armed group on the other, and maybe the state government. And nobody else in between. People are not involved. So they, they don't have a stake. In fact, they become victims, double, double, or triple, triple, and, and more times. The efforts by by uh, government that from boomerang because initiatives like the six schedule, which was developed at the time 
of independence and uh, by the constitution makers, essentially don't give enough adequate representation and powers to people, the people who come for a And uh, we have um, the, a situation where in areas where the Sikh schedule is in place, you have communities which are protected, whether it's in Meghalaya, uh, the Khasis, the Karos, and the Jaintias, but they're a majority. The Sikh schedule was to protect tribal minority. Today, in these states, in Mizoram, in uh, Meghalaya, the tribes are a majority. They run the states. They're not, but you still have the uh, district councils. And in Meghalaya, there is a demand for the inner line permit to be introduced. So, you know, and that has shut down Shillong or disrupted its activities for the last six months. So, when we talk about racism here, I'm coming to that point, we forget that we also do the same thing there. If in the Boro areas nobody is a majority, which means that everybody is a minority, in other places where other communities are majorities, people like many of you are minorities. So do you have rights? Do you have an opportunity to vote? Shillong, for example, has not had a municipal commission uh, council since 1972. Elections have not been held. Why? Because the students' union, which is extremely influential, and other groups believe that if you have elections, it would uh, harm the interests of the local communities. Uh, because in some areas of the municipal commission, uh, of the council, uh, non-tribals are a majority. But that, does that mean that you uh, do not have uh, these uh, elections? Should you not have representation in some form or the other for all? So um, racism here in, in, in Delhi and especially and in other uh, parts of the country is a very ugly reality. I'm sure that some of you may have experienced it. But what is also important for us to understand is that if we are to have an anti-discrimination law, then it must be an anti-discrimination law that protects those in need of protection everywhere. You cannot have just one group who are protected and the other groups are not. So some of us have actually said that the uh, prevention of atrocity uh, uh, for the scheduled tribes and scheduled trusts should be expanded, amended, I and mean, there's resistance to this, should be ex expanded to include a definition of discrimination on the basis of the appearance dress and so on. Whether that will go or not, I don't know. I mean, I was in the committee that the HRD ministry set up to look at issues of curricular changes and this issues of discrimination against Northeastern students. And this was one of the first recommendations that we made. Um, so uh, if we are to have an inclusive approach, it would be good for us to honestly evaluate for those of us from the Northeast, how we treat other people in the region, based on depending on their uh, ethnicity or religion or, or culture. Uh, why is it that Assam has border conflicts with each of its neighbors, Naga and Mizoram, Meghala and Orunachal Pradesh? Uh, is there something that we need to do there? Why is it that the Supreme Court intervenes and 30, 40 years after a boundary commission is instituted, we now have a Supreme Court mediator, a Supreme Court uh, appointed mediator to try and resolve problems between Assam and Nagaland. You know, this is the, the state of things. So we are as divided within the region, and perhaps we 
have problems of discrimination within the region as we face outside the region. So I think it would be good to have a, a, there is a level playing field and where we are a bit more honest about these things within the region as well as the problems that we face outside the region. Um, I close with one thing which is uh, relating to the, related to the Anko's special contact. Asfa, in my mind, is an abomination. You cannot have a law like this in India in the current stage. However, if the right wing and the conservative elements come to power, and there is every chance that they will, there is probably very little chance that it will be either repealed or reformed or uh, amended in any way. But I believe it should go for a very simple reason. Apart from its discriminatory element, it creates four levels of citizenship. The first level is the protection of the person in uniform. The second is the non-protection and total vulnerability of the person who should be protected, who are the communities who receive the impact of the so-called protected person. The third are categories like us. We are untouched by it here. But if you go there, you may be covered by it. And the fourth, to my mind, which is perhaps the most dangerous and insidious, is that state agencies law enforcement groups like the police, which are not covered by this law of impunity, actually are giving themselves the power without the legal provisions for it. And they're behaving more and more like security forces have done over the last few years. And I think that is very important for us, all of us, for you as students of law, who will be going out to practice and deal with a whole bunch of issues to review, to, to look at, and to see how we can best tackle this, this situation. Because it cannot be allowed to fester uh, like this any longer. We have short-term solutions always, which will create long-term very bad repercussions. I close here. Thank you.